What is going on, guys? This is Tyler from T-Bone MMA. So it's finally time for UFC Fight Night 167 live in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. The second appearance, or I should say the second Zufa-owned appearance in uh, that city in particular. It was way back, WEC 32, back in 2008. And then the second appearance in UFC history in New Mexico, they had, back in 2014, UFC Fight Night 42, which was live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So the first time in quite some time that the UFC is going to be in New Mexico. And I might actually have to go back and look at some of the ju previous judging uh, in those fights. I'm not sure exactly what kind of athletic commission that they have there in New Mexico. So I will be sure. I know there's a lot of regional promotions there. What's up, Murphy? What's up, Caleb? So uh, obviously, continuing to last week, uh, that's becoming very, very important and the talk of the town. And speaking of the 205-pound division, we got Jan Blachowicz against Corey Anderson, which... Uh, it's really some serious implications for the future title picture of the 205 pound division. And I wonder if John Jones, or what would have happened in that fight against Dominic Reyes and John Jones if it had turned out differently? Would that end up being a title fight, or this will be a number one contendership spot uh, for that weight class? But uh, the real one of the real positives I've ever seen here, watching from New Zealand, what's up in New Zealand? Uh, Reyes was robbed, I agree. Uh, so let's not get caught up on that too much. Obviously, that was a little bit disappointing, at least in my eyes. But the one positive that we can pull away from it, not necessarily just the main fight itself, the not just the Dominic Reyes and John Jones fight. There are many fights that I thought should have gone a different direction but didn't. So let's hope we can recover a little bit off, off after that one. That was tough. And we got a fantastic fight card from the bottom to the top and some interesting stats here. Or not, something that kind of jumped out at me here. Mark De La Rosa and Montana De La Rosa, the first um, husband and wife combo on a UFC fight card. And we got a lot of fights in front of us here. We got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 fights. So if y'all are in the New Mexico area, uh, that's going to be a fantastic fight card. Uh, 13 fights. So you're getting your money's worth there. Now, some interesting some interesting developments today. I was worried about it all week. Ray Borg fighting at 135, missed by one by nearly two pounds at 135, is going back down to 125, and he had just missed weight today, uh, weighing at 128, two pounds over the one pound allowance. So that's unfortunate. Um, so it's now a catch weight fight. He has to surrender 30% of his purse. And the, one of the more unfortunate parts about that is I, I question his longevity at 125 pounds considering the fact that he's moving back down. Uh, and there's a lot of implications there. And I have him winning that fight. Uh, so that's unfortunate. Uh, and some other interesting fights on the card. We got Casey Kenny against Marab Davala Shali. That's a fantastic fight. Devin Clark taking on Daquan Townsend. Uh, Daquan Townsend uh, is is replacing Gazimura and Antigulov. Uh, Antigulov was pulled from the fight due to undisclosed reasons uh, earlier this week, actually. And replaced by Daquan Townsend. Daquan Townsend hits hard, and Devin Clark, one of the bigger favorites on the card. Jim Miller taking on Scott Holtzman. Uh, John Donson against Nathaniel Wood. Tim Meads against Daniel Rodriguez. Uh, and Daniel Rodriguez taking this fight on relatively short notice, too, in January. And we got some fantastic fights in the main card, too. Land of Anad against Yancy Medeiros. This fight is specifically generated for the stand-up fighter's dream, essentially. Uh, the people that love flashy knockouts and stuff like that, I really think we're in for a treat against Yancy Medeiros and Land of Anad. We got Ray Borg moving back down to 125 against the 16-1 Rogerio Bautarin. Uh, newcomers Brock Weaver and Kazula Vargas. Kazula Vargas actually has one fight. Montana De La Rosa against Mario Romero Barella. Diego Sanchez is on the card. Jan Blachowicz against Corey Anderson. We are in for a good one. Team wants the man. What's up? Borg will cut. Will be cut now. You think so? We, we, sh we shall see, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But to kick things off, here is Bruce Buff. And now presenting the champion fighting. Out of the red corner, this man is a podcaster. He stands six feet two inches tall, weighing in at 185 pounds. Podcasting out of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 
presenting the host of T-Bone MMA Podcast, Tyler T-Bone Brack! All right, thank you very much, Bruce Buffer. So the first fight on the main card, I'm only covering the main card fights. Uh, in depth, there's a lot of changes to the preliminary fights, and there's just too many to cover in such a short amount of time. So I'm just sticking with the main card fights. If you guys want to follow along with my predictions, I have them up there on the board as well. I'm pretty much going. There's not really two big of favorites on the card. I believe Devin Clark's the largest favorite on the card. And uh, there's really not a whole lot on the main card in terms of lopsided, big underdogs, or big favorites. Uh, unless there's late money being thrown out there, and I don't officially have the, the odds written down, unfortunately. So I will update you guys tomorrow on that one, but I still will stay true to my picks tonight. So anyway, the 155-pound division, we got Lando Venati and Cianci Medeiros, who are two fighters that just are so fun to watch, but just can't quite gain too much traction in the 155-pound division. And both starting off their careers with uh, a lot of hype, too. Lando Venata is from the United States. He's got a record of 10 victories with four losses, with four knockouts, five submissions, and one decision victory. Yancy Medeiros are 10, 10 wins, four losses, and two draws in his mixed martial arts career. Yancy Medeiros is from the United States. He's got a record of 15 victories with six losses, with eight knockouts, four submissions, and three decision victories. The best intro ever. I appreciate it, Philly. Uh, there's a fight tonight. No, it's uh, tomorrow night. Or these fights are tomorrow night. I got enough. <laughs> the fights are tomorrow. He's doing a preview for the fights tomorrow. I don't know why. Is there a big boxing match on tonight that I'm not aware of? Because a lot of people are asking me about that. But anyway, we got Yancy Medeiros against Lando Venata. Let's start off with Yancy Medeiros. He stands at 5'10". This is a 75.5 inch reach. Uh, four and a half inch reach advantage, inch reach advantage over Lando Venata. Against Medeiros, he's got a record of six and six with one no contest in his UFC career. Six and four in his last ten fights uh, with victories over Damon Jackson uh, via reverse bulldog choke. He defeated Joe Proctor via guillotine choke and a TKO loss against Dustin Poirier. He defeated John McDessie via split decision before having a unanimous decision loss against Francisco Trinaldo. Then won a three fight win streak defeating Sean Spencer via rear naked choke. Defeated, defeated Eric Silva via TKO, and defeated Alex Oliveira via TKO to earn himself 2017 ESPN Fight of the Year uh, before losing to Cowboy Cerrone and losing to Gregor Gillespie in his last fight via TKO in January of 2019. He began his career at a whopping 205 pounds and kind of credits the Diaz brothers really in making that weight class change back down to 155 pounds uh, the right way. I also went 2-0 in strike force. Uh, he lands 4.6 uh, significant strikes per minute and absorbs 6.05 uh, as a 7 minute and 7 second average fight time and only a 24% takedown defense. Now, considering Lando Fanata is a brown belt Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I wonder if he'll try to expose that a little bit. He's got a 1.46 knockdown ratio in each of his fights. Uh, he's only landed in his last fight against Gregor Gillespie. is one of the toughest fights that he had in his career. He only landed one significant strike against Gregor Gillespie. Uh, Gillespie got on top of him. He had a last second TKO victory in the second round. Uh, pretty much took him down and dominated the fight. You know, it, it, Greg Gillespie, it's easy to look at his last performance against. Um, it's easy to look at his last fight, that knockout victory, that, that he, knockout that he had against Kevin Lee uh, with a grain of salt a little bit. But going into that fight, he's one of the scariest prospects at 155 pounds and I was expecting him to run through the division and possibly take on Habib in the future of course everything changed with Kevin Lee landed that one big head kick knockout uh, he pulled out or he had a knee he had a knee, uh, rib injury excuse me against Mike Perry in July 2018 he hasn't fought too often if you were a fighter back in the day would you rather fight for strike force pride or UFC the pride days were fun but at the same time everybody's on steroids it would have been fun to be on steroids and fighting in Pride, of course. I don't... The one-night tournaments, Bob Sapp, there's a lot of fun. I, I don't know what it is. I've fought in multiple one-day tournaments, uh, but that's not quite the same as Pride Grand Prix. but that sounds pretty fun. Back in the day, probably Pride in the, Super, in the Super Arenas in Japan. I might have to go with Pride. Um... 
I think not Meg. You do not really have a. I got uh, De La Rosa and Rogerio winning. Nice to have an evening breakdown with my boy T-Bon after a long day at work. I appreciate it. I actually had the day off today, so happy President's Day week weekend, by the way. Uh, Nancy Medeiros, he's been relatively inactive his last couple of fights. I'll, I'll throw that up. I've been meaning to integrate. Uh, I, I used to do it in the past where I would have the uh, the display up so y'all could see like their records in depth. Yeah, he fought two and he went two and zero in strike force. In that's at middleweight, by the way. He went straight from middleweight to one hundred fifty five pounds in his UFC debut. He had that no contest against Eve Edwards, which was originally a knockout victory for him, but overturned after testing positive to a uh, to marijuana, unfortunately. Like I said, he's on a three fight win streak, but really hasn't fought too much since two thousand and seventeen. He fought once in twenty eighteen, had a rib injury, has been out for a long uh, long duration of time. Then back in January of last year, he lost to Gregor Gillespie. VTKO dominant performance turned in by Gregor Gillespie. A tough fight going uh, against him, and he's been out for nearly a year since then. And uh, he's taking on Lando Panada. He's got a record of two victories and four losses. And in his, in his uh, UFC career. So he was originally scheduled to face off against Habib, and that was in the early, early process when that kind of fell through. One of the first times they tried to put that fight card together. And all of a sudden, this newcomer named Lana Venata, he was fresh off, he, he did win the top shelf entertainment 155 pound championship in Colorado previous to his debut and came up with a lot of hype. Uh, but nobody was expecting Tony Ferguson to rate number three at the time. It was really kind of next in line for the title shot in the near future. And he went out there and nearly beat Tony Ferguson uh, and ended up kind of punching himself out a little bit and losing via Dar Choke. But gosh, that would have been one of the biggest upsets ever. And I, I remember watching that. It's ingrained in my head when he landed that head kick on Tony Ferguson. Tony Ferguson ran into the cage. I thought he was done. I, I, I thought he was going to win that fight. Nearly pulled off the biggest upset in UFC history. So he came in with a lot of hype. And then he had a perform performance of the night, one of the knockouts of the year against John McDessie, where he had that wheel kick knockout. Uh, and since then, just hasn't quite gained a whole lot of momentum. He had that loss, unanimous decision loss against Dan David Timor, which did earn himself fight of the night. He had the split draw against Bobby Green to earn himself fight of the night. And he had one point deducted for an illegal knee, which definitely went against him there. He would have won that fight if it hadn't been for that one-point deduction. Then he had that loss against Gar Close via unanimous decision. Had the majority draw against Matt Favola. So he's got two draws in his UFC career. Had a Kimura victory over Mark uh, Marcus Rosa Mariano. First time in, a, in, a, in his UFC career where we saw a submission game as well. Then he had a unanimous decision loss against Mark DeCasey in September 2018. So he's been out for a significant amount of time since then. Uh, he had the 2016 knockout of the year against John McDessie. And a recent camp changed the the BMF ranch of, of all places. Kind of trains jointly with Cowboy Cerrone over the BMF ranch. And kind of trains jointly with Greg Jackson. Uh, and he's always made a career at Greg Jackson's camp. You'll see a common trend. A lot of New Mexico fighters on this card as well. Uh, and honestly, on the main card, I actually kind of found that surprising. Land of United lands 4.96 significant strikes per minute and absorbs 5.19. So they definitely go at it for sure, both of these guys. Uncle Chael has entered the chat. Where's Chael at? Uh, he's a brown belt Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as well with five submission victories, including two Renega chokes, a heel hook, an arm triangle, and a Kimura. He's landed six of 18 takedowns in his eight-fight career uh, in the UFC at a 44% success rate. I got Lando Venata winning this fight via round one knockout, and quite honestly, this fight is so close. I, I, I nearly was about to predict a draw for the first time in my career, but I always think it's stupid to go predict a draw but i think that's actually somewhat likely considering that these guys uh one fighter could get hurt and then they and they could come back and get win two rounds it's, it's a very interesting fight and i love the stand-up battle that we got ahead of us here both complete gamers especially yancy medeiros uh, he's already a fight of the year he won espn fight of the year against alex Oliveira, and by the way fight of the year for espn that includes boxing, kickboxing. That's just combat sports in general. So that's a really prestigious award to win. That's not just mixed martial arts or just the UFC. That's all combat sports in general. So that's a very prestigious award. And that's I think that's an SB on top of that too. So I think we're in a fan we got we have a fantastic treat ahead of us with Yancy Madero's and Lana Venata. What do y'all what do y'all think about that one? Yancy uh, Yancy tens. 
to take foot off the gas. Okay. I think Tony Ferguson's going to beat Habib. Let's not get into that quite yet. I'll have plenty of times. Uh, if the judges had gave the fight to Dominic Reyes, would have been one of the biggest upset. Would that have been the biggest upset in UFC history? Are you, if you're asking me, I do not think so. I uh, think, but man, it's it's close though. I definitely think uh, Matt Serra against GSP will be statistically the biggest upset in UFC history, in my opinion. Uh, but anyway, the next fight on the card, we got uh, Rogerio Bartorin against uh, Ray Borg in the 125-pound division. Unfortunate for Ray Borg, missed weight, and really unfortunate for this whole fight because uh, Ray Borg is one of the bigger... This is a relatively close fight, actually. I think Ray Borg's a slight favorite going into this one. And if Ray Borg does pull off a victory here, I don't think that he'll be at 125 again. And I'm actually kind of surprised he's trying to make the jump back down to 125 considering that he's missed weight multiple times at 125 and even missed weight at 135 on top of that so i think there's a lot of problems going in this fight for ray borg just um just in terms of the weight department i think everything else goes and hit his favor in this fight but anyway number six ranked rogerio Bont bontorin uh, he's got a record of 16 victories with one loss in his mixed martial arts career with three knockouts 11 submissions and two decision victories biggest upset gsp and john johnny hendrix uh, Ray, <laughs> Ray Borg is from the United States. He's got a record of 12 victories and four losses. Well, one knockout, six submissions, and five decision victories. Ray Borg stands at 5'4", 63-inch reach. And uh, Bontorin stands at 5'5", and has a 67-inch reach. So, four-inch reach advantage going in favor for the Brazilian. Uh, Ray Borg, he's got a UFC record of six victories and four losses with a split decision loss against Dustin Ortiz back in 2014 in his UFC debut. And then he defeated Shane Howell via Uriah Nekachok. Then he defeated Chris Kalatis via Kimura, showing his submission game in the UFC. And then defeated Jane Herrera via unanimous decision, missing weight in that fight. Lost to Justin Skill against the unanimous decision. Defeated Luis Smolka via unanimous decision. Again, missed weight in that fight too, so he missed weight twice at 125. Uh, defeated UFCR from Mega, and then lost to Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson via round five flying armbar, and really was just getting dominated that entire fight on top of that. Then moved up to 135 pounds, where he lost a controversial unanimous decision uh, against Casey Kenny, where he weighed in at 137, missing weight at 135. And then in his last fight, defeated Gabriel Silva, making weight at 135 back in July of 2019, winning that fight via unanimous decision. In that loss against Casey Kenny, he landed seven takedowns, controlled seven minutes and 16 seconds of that fight. Uh, was just kind of outstruck a little bit in that fight. It was a real tough fight. I, I, I had that fight going to Ray Borg. It was a very controversial decision, in my opinion. Uh, he's got six submission victories, including five renegade jokes and a Kimura. He's had no submission since 2015, however. Uh, he lands 1.29 significant strikes per minute, which is a pretty darn low, actually, and, uh, land, and absorbs 1.95, which is also low. He's got a 46% takedown defense rate. He's landed 33 of 66 takedowns, which is fifth, and at, uh, at a 50% success rate, which is fifth at 155 pounds. And he lands 3.66 takedowns per 15 minutes. That's a significant amount. Unfortunately, I couldn't find out. Uh, if that's the most at, you, at flyweight history or even find a top 10 list. But I have to imagine that's extremely high. Emin Shabazi is the real middleweight king. I'll tell you what, he could be if he keeps it up. He's taking on number seven ranked uh, Rogerio Bant Bantorin. Bantorin has a 2-0 record in the UFC where he defeated Magomed Bibiolata via controversial split decision as well and then defeated Halian Paiva via round one TKO due to Dr. Stoppage via cut back in August 2019. He defeated uh, Gustavo Gabriel Silva via round two in a choke on Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series Brazil uh, to earn his spot in, in the UFC. He was outstruck and was out taken down by Baby Wilde of 66 to 52 in the significant strike department. was taken down 4 to 1. Uh, he's got a 60% takedown defense rate in the UFC. Uh, throw, uh, lands 2.66 significant strikes per minute and absorbs 5.58. Now, the stats don't really go in his favor into this fight, but just from watching him, by the way, he's got 11 submission victories in his mixed martial arts career with eight minute chokes, a heel hook, and two arm bars. He's on a four fight win streak as well. His last loss, his only loss in his mixed martial arts career, was against Michinori Tanaka via round three, rear naked choke. That was after Michinori was just cut from the UFC. And then uh, get, or that was immediately after he got cut from the UFC, his first fight outside of the UFC. So I don't really hold that against him too much. That is kind of a step of competition, honestly. 
uh, in his fight against Julian Paiva. It was a giant cut above the right eye. It was a flush knee that landed on the right eye. It was like right right there. It was one of the worst spots, and it wasn't really like it was that wide of a cut. It was just the circular. It was like circular, and it was just an enormous cut. It wasn't bleeding that much, but just considering the fact that the placement of it, it was wasn't bleeding too much. If he had been in just a different spot, it probably would have continued. The doctor took about 10 seconds, looked at it. He's like, yeah, fight, fight's over. And, and I have to agree with it, unfortunately. It, it's, it, it's always disappointing, especially that was the first round. That was the first round, by the way. It's a flush knee that connected on the right eye. And then immediately after that, it was like a perfectly placed right hook. And I think the glove might have caught it and ripped it just a little bit more. It was super unfortunate uh, what happened there. Uh, and the massive cut ended up being a stop. Ended up being a stoppage there, earning his first TKO victory in his in his UFC career. Um, what I'm kind of seeing from him, he's a very difficult guy to hold down. Uh, Bibi Lotto took him down four times in that fight, but uh, but Batorin has a very active guard, a very tough guard to pass, and he he really he leaves it open. He's consistently putting feet on the hips, trying to gain separation, and always trying to stand back up, throwing submissions. He's got two arm bars. Uh, off his back he's an exciting fighter uh he's got good stand-up he's very light on his feet you can definitely tell he's extremely comfortable despite his, him only having three knockouts in his mixed martial arts career he's very comfortable on the feet and is very good on the ground you know 11 submissions is very impressive you make uh this early on in your ufc career and just from what I've seen, especially against Mega Man Baby Olatov, which is a very tough fight for anybody, and even though that was a very controversial victory, I had that fight going to Baby Olatov, uh, looking back at that one. Um, it was a tough fight to score, and he's got a very active guard. He's a very tough guy to hold down. And even though he's got a 60% takedown defense, he doesn't go down easy. He doesn't go down easy, and when you get him down, he's always actively looking for a way to get up. He attacks from the bottom. It's a very exciting fighter to watch. Uh, however, I think Ray Borg, he's got 33 takedowns in his, in his uh, UFC, just his UFC career. I think that will kind of be uh, Bunterin's Achilles heel going into this fight. So I think Ray Borg is going to win this fight via round three unanimous decision. Uh, that is, uh, Ray Borg, we obviously know he's missed weight multiple times. And every single time he's missed weight, pardon me, aside from one, he's 2-1 and one when missing weight in his uh, UFC career. But I won 25 every time that he's missed weight. He has won still. So I don't think the weight cut's going to be too big of a factor going into this one for Ray Borg. But we'll, we'll, we'll see because he fought his last two fights at 135 and he hasn't fought at 125 since losing to, to Demetrius Johnson back in 2017. So I, I, I'm, I'm really pulling because I don't think Ray Borg's going to going to make a career at 125. I do think it's going to be a one and done at 125. I do think that he'll move back up to 135 because if you're missing weight at 135, and you miss weight multiple times at 125, and you miss weight again, it's, it's it's just tough to pull for you at that weight class. There's too many problems there. So I think he'll go back up to 135. And if he if he takes out a guy who's 16-1 at 125, it, it's, it's going to be tough to recover that for, for a month or in. But... Uh, the 125-pound division is just not quite stacked as it used to be. So even though if Bontonarin does have a loss on his record, I think that he'll be immediately be able to make that up. But 16-1, he's got a lot of potential in the division. I'm excited to see him fight again. Ray Borg, unfortunately, I was super excited for this fight. But man, him missing weight, really, I'm really pulling for Bontonarin. I hope I'm wrong there. I was hoping Ray Borg was, would make weight and make another run at 125, but especially with the new title picture that we have in the future. Man, that hurts me a little bit, the fact that this that Ray Borg missed weight. But let's recover that. Uh, we got another great fight ahead of us in the 155-pound division with relatively relatively newcomers here, the 155 pounds. We got Brock Weaver against Kazula Vargas, a surprising addition to the main card. And there must be something that I'm missing because these guys, I've seen them before. They're exciting to watch, but... Um, uh, it was kind of a kind of a surprising addition to the main card, especially uh, the top four fights. But anyway, Brock Weaver is from Alabama. He's got a record of 14 victories with four losses with two knockouts, three submissions, and eight decision victories to include a one disqualification victory as well. Kazula Vargas from Mexico. He's got a record of 10 victories with three losses with six knockouts, 
uh, three submissions, and one decision victory. Brock Weaver stands at six foot, has a 73 inch reach. Kazula Vargas stands at five eight and has a 71 and a half inch reach. Kazula Vargas has gone 0 1 in his UFC career, where he lost to Alex da Silva Coelho via unanimous decision back in August 2019. Was taken down three times, uh, was outstruck by da Silva 20 to 17. However, Alex da Silva won in all three judges' scorecards 30 to 27 after controlling top position for 11 minutes. Kazula Vargas definitely showed that there's an Achilles heel in his game. And that's in the takedown department. He obviously has knockouts to his credit and submission abilities to his credit. He's got six knockout victories. This is Joe Rogan. Thank you. Um, held top position for 11 minutes. It was unfortunate there. It was completely shot down. It was shut down offensively. He's got a 25% takedown offense in the UFC. He stopped one of the three, one of the four takedowns. Uh, against Alex da Silva in his first UFC fight, six and one in his last seven fights, going into that last matchup with five finishes, six and two now in his last eight fights. He's got six first round finishes to include an 18 second knockout over Mike De La Torre in Combat to Americas. Uh, Mike De La Torre, you might remember him. He's a seven fight UFC veteran as well, knock him out in 18 seconds just prior to his UFC debut. So he came in with a lot of hype. And he's a very aggressive fighter. He's got some knockout power, especially in the first round. However, if you get him down to the ground, and I'm really excited to see exactly how he's going to be able to make that adjustment. I'm always kind of, uh, that's, a, that's why I'm extremely critical of guys going into their UFC debut with that kind of resume, those first round knockouts. Emin Shabazzian even comes to mind. We were talking about him a little bit earlier. Uh, young guys with a lot of knockout victories. What happens when you get taken down? What happens when you don't get that first round finish? How are you going to react to that? Because it's bound to happen in the UFC. You're always going to run to a guy that you're just not. That, that, that's just not going to work against. And Kazula Vargas, he got taken down, was completely dominated. So I'm wondering what kind of adjustments, adjustments that he's going to make into this fight against Brock Weaver. Brock Weaver is making his UFC debut. He defeated Devin Smith via unanimous decision on Dan White's UFC contender series back in August 2019. He's on a seven-fight win streak in Island Fights, which is a Florida promotion that has produced a lot of fighters. Um, he holds a split decision victory over Car Charles Crazy Horse Bennett during, his, during Crazy Horse Bennett's 11-fight losing streak recently. I thought I'd throw that in there. I saw Charles Bennett, and we don't see his name thrown out too often. Uh, and you might remember Brock Reaver, too. He had a unanimous decision loss against Joe Riggs of Bare Knuckle Fighting Championships in October 2018. It's extremely rare to see a guy fighting in Bare Knuckle and then fighting the UFC. I, I don't think I've seen that before yet. I've seen, a, I've seen it go the other direction a lot. And going three rounds with Joe Diesel Riggs of Bare Knuckle Fighting is still pretty impressive. And Joe Diesel Riggs, by the way, is actually on quite the winning streak. Uh, I'm not sure if he's ever going to make a comeback, like a full-time comeback, but I was looking at Joe Riggs, so I'm like, man, I haven't seen his name in a while. He's doing pretty well, actually. Uh, Brock Weaver usually fights at 170 pounds. He made weight at 155. Uh, he's a little crazy from what I saw. He's got some good heart. Uh, it was a tough first round against Devin Smith, and he got hit a couple times. He's got high output, like his output kind of crescendos into the later rounds. Was taken down four times but was able to outstrike his opponent 50 to 44, especially in the latter two rounds. He had a tough first round where he was taken down, got hit a lot. Last two rounds were all his. He ended up getting the decision victory over Devin Smith to earn a spot within the UFC. So I got this fight going to Brock Weaver uh, via unanimous decision. I do think it's Zillow Vargas just watching his UFC debut. He does pose some problems for Brock Weaver if it's standing up, however, I believe that Brock Weaver, I'm wondering what kind of approach that he will take in going into this fight. He's not primarily known as a wrestler, uh, but considering the fact that Kazula Vargas had a very tough fight in his last fight against Alex da Silva, was taking up multiple times, I do think Brock Weaver will at least try to expose that a little bit. So I got to go with Brock Weaver into this fight. And even without that, I do think that this fight will not end quick. I do think Brock Weaver is just a little bit... I don't see Brock Weaver going down in the first round, is what I'm trying to say there. And if this fight does reach a decision, I got Brock Weaver winning that one. All right, the next fight on the card is a very important fight for the 125-pound rankings. And I was kind of overlooking this one, and I was actually pretty excited. We got number 12-ranked Montana De La Rosa against number 13-ranked Mara Romero Barella. Oh, he's so many R's. I've always had a tough time pronouncing her name, Mara Romero Barella. Montana De La Rosa is from the United States. She's got a record of 10 victories with 5 losses with 8 submissions and 2 decision victories and 0 knockouts in her mixed martial arts career. She stands at 5'7", has a 68-inch reach. And Varela is from Italy. She's got a record of 12 victories with 6 losses with 3 knockouts, 4 submissions, and 5 decision victories. 
Uh, she stands at 5'6", has a 69-inch reach. Barella, she's got a record of 2-2 two and two in her UFC career, where she defeated Kalyandra Faria via rear naked choke. Lost to Kenji Kagan via unanimous decision, defeated Italiana Santos via split decision, and her last fight lost to Lauren Murphy back in August 2019 via vicious knockout. Uh, she trains out of American top team in Coconut Creek, Florida. She's a black belt in junior and a blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with four submission victories to include three arm bars and a rear naked choke, which I think is very important going into this matchup. She's landed seven takedowns in her four-fight UFC career with a 41% accuracy and a 67% takedown defense rate. She lands 2.98 significant strikes per minute and absorbs 2.87. In that fight against Laura Murphy, she went in for a takedown. And that takedown one stuffed. Laura Murphy got one, one underhook, was framing off with her palm, landed a knee just so flush to the side of the face and knocked her completely out cold. It was a vicious knockout, especially for the 125-pound division. Now... When uh, Borelli usually gets the fight down to the ground, it's usually from the clinch position, considering she's a black belt in uh, judo. Uh, she usually goes in for a, usually tries to get double underhooks, try to go for an outside trip or something along those lines, or even up against the cage, she's had some mild success with as well. Uh, she's taking on number 12 ranked Montana De La Rosa. She's got a regular 3 1 in her UFC career, where she defeated Christi uh, Christina Marca Marks via round one armbar defeat. Defeated Rachel Estovich via round three and a choke, and defeated Nadia Kassam via round two armbar during herself performance of the night. But then lost to Andrea Lee via an decision in her last fight back in June 2019. She's a pro by Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with eight submission victories to include five armbars and three rear naked chokes. Uh, she was an Ultimate Fighter champion, Will Be Crowned, where she defeated Ariel Beck via Dar's choke, and then lost to the future winner, Nico Montagna via round two unanimous decision. Uh, she hasn't been to a decision, uh, hasn't, ha hasn't, been to a decision since two thousand, or hasn't had a decision victory since 2016. She's got a 3.13 submission average, lands 3.46 significant strikes per minute, and absorbs 2.29. Uh, that loss against Andrea Lee snapped a four-fight win streak that she was on. She landed five takedowns in the fight against Lee, but however was outstruck on the feet, 73 to 14. And Andrea Lee, at least on paper, I was very, kind of disappointed with the outcome of the uh, Lauren Murphy fight. It was a close fight. Uh, tough for the judge. Tough for the judges. I'm not giving. I'm not knocking on them for that fight in particular. It was a tough fight in general, but mostly disappointed in Andrea Lee uh, in that last fight against Lauren Murphy. That is. But however, uh, Andrea Lee on the feet is one of the most credentialed women's 125 pounders uh, in the stand department, really in women's history. If you look at her accolades that she has, multiple time amateur Golden Gloves champion in boxing, multiple time kickboxing world champion. Uh, Montana that the other Rose who got smoked on the feet essentially in that fight. So I think that this is gonna be a very important fight for both of them for the longevity of their careers, especially at 125. Uh, and there's a lot of fights at 125. They're really trying to establish that division. It really has come to fruition well. And both of these girls coming off of losses, it's really important for them to get a victory in this fight. So I'm expecting a very fun fun fight. Relatively conservative fight for both of them. I got Montana De La Rosa via round two submission. I do think Barella is going to try to get this fight down to the ground. I believe that Montana De La Rosa will get an armbar off her back. It's going to be a fun one. That's really t that's a tough, tough call in my opinion. This is one of the tougher fights that I have to pick here. I hope you see some positive training, uh, changes with TriStar. He seems like he'll be more composed, but who knows. We'd love to see Jones versus Walker at some point. We shall see. Most screen, what's up? And then a, a very fun fight. I, I still love seeing Diego Sanchez's name on a card. The 170-pound division, Diego Sanchez against Michelle Pereira. Um, Diego Sanchez from the United States, the original Ultimate Fighter, the very first Ultimate Fighter winner is still fighting, which is nuts. Uh, Diego Nightmare Sanchez. I know he changed his nickname recently. I will always know him as Nightmare. He's from the United States. He's got a record of 29 victories with 12 losses with 10 knockouts, 6 submissions, and 13 decision victories. Michelle Pereira is from Brazil. He's got a record of 23 and 10 with 10 knockouts, 6 submissions, and 6 decision victories, as well as having one undisclosed finish. Uh, Sanchez stands at 5'10", he's got a 72-inch reach, and Michelle Pereira standing at 6'1", has a 75-inch reach. Pereira, he's got a record of 1-1 in his UFC career, where he defeated Danny Roberts via round one flying knee. What a way to make a UFC debut. And then lost to the newcomer, Tristan Connolly, one of the biggest upsets, one of the most underrated upsets of 2019. Uh, via unanimous decision, Tristan Connolly fighting in his home country of Canada, taking it to Michelle Pereira, taking him down multiple times, and eventually getting a unanimous decision victory, one of the bigger upsets of the year. I took that fight on relative short, short notice. I was supposed to corner someone on that fight. Took the fight against Michelle Pereira. Michelle Pereira came into the UFC with already a lot of hype. 
And then that knockout win over Danny Roberts. So he came in as a minus 450 favorite. And then on six days notice, Tristan Connolly um, dominated the last few fights with lots of takedowns, lots of great striking. However, Michelle Pereira did have a great first round, uh, but ultimately lost that fight. It was controlled five minutes and 38 seconds. Was outstruck 151 to 56 in that fight. I was on a 7-1 and 2 no contest run prior to that loss. And he, he's really known. He's kind of a crazy fighter. He's almost like a mini Johnny Walker in a way. That might be a little bit exaggerated, but I'll, I'll stick with it there. Uh, it's a very unorthodox type of fighter, let me tell you that much. And uh, Justin Connolly took it to him, and that was quite shocking. To say that he's a little Johnny Walker might actually be... It, just wait until you see him. I wonder if he'll kind of have that same approach, because he loves very, very acrobatic, that is. And I wonder if he'll kind of come in with that same approach. He was very exciting to watch, and I was expecting him to go a long way in the division. Uh, but since losing that fight, man, people aren't really talking about him. We were, especially I was, I was excited to see him. Um, but man, uh, he came in with a lot of hype, and I'm wondering if he'll kind of come in with that same approach. He loves, he's a very acrobatic fighter. If you guys remember the backflips in the middle of the fight, that's, this, that's Michel Pereira. He... He's fun. He's fun to watch. Uh, but I'm wondering what kind of approach that he'll have. If he'll be a little bit more conservative against Diego Sanchez, uh, what kind of approach that he will have. It's going to be fun to watch. There's a reason why this fight's a co-main event fight. It's not just because of Diego Sanchez. It's just as equal um, equal credit to Michelle Pereira, too. Diego Sanchez, 18-12 and 12 in his UFC career. 2-2 two and two at 170 in his last four fights. We lost to Matt Brown via round one elbow knockout. Vicious knockout back in 2017. Then defeated Craig White via name decision. And then surprising everybody, finishing Mickey Gall via strikes at UFC 235 to earn himself performance of the night. His first TKO victory. His first finish was 2008. Uh, that came out of nowhere. And then recently at unanimous decision loss against Michael Chiesa, which was a fun fight. Uh, definitely showed that he can hang in there at the top of the 170-pound division. Of course, Michael Chiesa jumping up a weight class. His first fight at 170 at the time. Now ranked in the top 10. I, I have to assume I actually haven't checked the rankings. But just recently defeating Rafael Los Santos. Uh, Diego Sanchez got the fifth most fight time in UFC history at 6 hours, 8 minutes, and 58 seconds. And that's crazy considering the fact that he's only got one first, he's only got one five-round fight and it didn't even make it the distance. Um, he was 17-0 before losing to Josh Koscheck and John Fitch. Went on a four-fight win streak to include a fight of the year against Clay Guida. And then fought for the title against BJ Penn, which was a very important fight for T Bone MMA's history, actually, because that was the first pay per view that I was ever actually able to scrap up enough money for and buy it on my own. I was extremely excited. He also had a 2013 fight of the year, one of the most underrated fights in history against Gabriel, um, against Gilbert Melendez. He's also a black belt Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He's got no real submission victories since 2004. He's got two submission due to punches. I got Diego Sanchez via round three submission. He's threatened me the multiple times before. I always, and for some reason, whenever I have, and whenever I'm picking Diego Sanchez, I just want to see him be winning via submission because I just remember watching the video of him getting his black belt and everybody whipping him with their belts. And I'm telling you, he's got a great submission game. We just haven't seen it too much in the last 16 years. <laughs> um, but man, I want to see it. I want to see it so bad, so I'm throwing it up there. I got Diego Sanchez winning this fight via submission. In the latter rounds, I do think Michelle Pereira, he's definitely a strong starter. There's no doubt about that. But he kind of tends to fade a little bit. Uh, that's at least what we saw against Tristan Connolly. What do you guys think about that one? Respect for Pereira for not hitting Roberts when he was out. Yeah, I agree with that one. What do you guys think? Diego Sanchez via submission, his first one in 16 years. I want to see it. I want to see it so bad. I, I truly believe that he... That's not, not just because I want to see it so bad. Uh, I truly believe that... Uh, at least in the stand department, Michelle Pereira is definitely, I think, way better than Diego Sanchez. But Diego Sanchez, I think the gap is much, much wider for him on the ground. So I'm picking a submission victory. He's threatened with it multiple times in the last 16 years. He's got a great, uh, he's got a great ground game as it is. I do think we'll see a little bit of that. At least I hope. Anyway, the 205 pound division. We got number five ranked Corey Anderson against number six ranked Yam Lahovich. Uh, number five, Corey Anderson from the United States. He's got a record of 13-4 with five knockouts and eight decision victories. 
Uh, Jan Blachowicz from Poland. He's got a record of 25 and 8 with 6 knockouts, 9 submissions, and 10 decision victories. Corey Anderson, 6 foot 3, has a 79 inch reach. And Jan Blachowicz, 6 2, and has a 78 inch reach. Everything on paper in terms of height, right, height and weight and reach is virtually identical. Jan Blachowicz has got a record of 8 and 5 in his UFC career, 6 and 1 in his last 7 fights. With victories over Devin Clark via round 2 submission, defeated Jan Jared Cannonier via M decision, defeated Jamie Manoa via M decision, defeated Nikita Krylov via round 2 arm triangle. Then at round three, TKO loss against Tiago Santos. And since then, defeated uh, Luke Rockhold via knockout. <laughs> and then defeated Jacques Ray Souza via split decision back in November 2019. He was the KSW 205-pound champion, defending that belt two times. He began his UFC career 2-4 and four with victories over Lila Latifi and uh, Igor uh, Pokracic. But then lost to Jimmy Manoa and Corey Anderson. Also lost to um, Alexander Gustafson and Patrick Cummins. The majority of the decision. He's also he's a black bummer in jiu-jitsu with nine submission victories to include three arm bars, four rear naked chokes, a standing bulldog choke. That was against Devin Clark. It was kind of like a standing rear naked choke because it was kind of interesting to see. Um, and then an arm triangle choke as well. His knockout over Luke Rocco was his first knockout uh, since 2014 where he knocked out a little Latifi. Uh, he's 12-25 in his 13 fight UFC career in the takedown department. His first fight between... Corey Anderson, Jan Blachowicz. Corey Anderson outstruck Blachowicz 156 to 33 in total. Landed four of four on takedowns with six passes. And Jan Blachowicz in the third round landed a whopping zero strikes. I see this fight going somewhat seriously, uh, similarly. However, five rounds. Number five by Corey Anderson has got a record of 10 and four in his UFC career. Is right now on a four fight win streak. Five and three in his last eight with a split decision loss against Shogun Hua at UFC 198. And again, that was the most Brazilian card of all time. It was in front of 44,000 Brazilian fans. He a lot of a lot was stacked up against him there. And Shogun, who ended up pulling off the split decision victory, and then he had a TKO victory with Sean O'Connell, had a knockout loss against Jimmy Manoa, and then had that round three head kick loss against Oban St. Pru at UFC 217. That was a vicious knockout. But since then, it's on a four or five win streak. Uh, defeating Patrick Cummins via unanimous decision, defeating Global Teixeira via unanimous decision, defeating Alir Latifi via unanimous decision. And then his last fight, shocking the world, and I think people are starting to forget about this a little bit, knocking out Johnny Brocker in the first round of UFC 244. Who was expecting that, by the way? I can guarantee you, I, I, I think, according to, uh, what's that on Instagram, fightverdicts.com or something like that, I can't remember. But anyway, I think it was somewhere around around the lines of 1% to 2% for picking Corey Anderson to be around one knockout. Wow. Yeah, by the way, happy Valentine's Day, everybody. I, I forgot about that. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, whenever I see happy, by the way, whenever on Instagram during Valentine's Day, I always see the picture of Yola Romero kissing Luke Rockle, but I actually didn't see it. Uh, so whenever I think of Valentine's Day, that's what I think of. It's weird, isn't it? Corey Anderson, 52 of 104 takedowns uh, in his UFC career. 4.96 takedowns landed per minute at a 50% success rate, which is third at 205-pound division. There's 52 takedowns, which puts him at number seven in UFC history. And number one at 205 pounds, he also has an 83% takedown defense rate, which is also one of the highest at 205 pounds as well. Lands 4.37 stimulus strikes per minute and absorbs 2.2. Whether that's a plus 2.17 significant strike differential right there. I got Corey Anderson winning this fight via round five, unanimous decision, relatively dominant. Do I see him facing off against John Jones in the future? Yes. Do I see him facing off against him? No. But I also asked you guys, what do you guys want to see? If you guys haven't voted yet, look at the community section on um, on my on my channel. And I had a poll out there. What do y'all want to see? Would you rather see a rematch with Dominic Reyes, John Jones stepping up a weight class to face uh, face against Stipe Miocic, uh, Israel Adesanya? Would you rather see him jump up in weight and face um, and face him? Sixty-two percent of you wanted to see Dominic Reyes rematch. Uh, Nineteen percent of you wanted to see Jan Blachowicz against Corey Anderson, the winner of this fight, take on John Jones, which I actually kind of found surprising. Nineteen percent of you actually wanted that. That's out of the I think it was 183 people that voted. 8% uh, of you wanted to see Stipe Miocic. More of you wanted to see Israel Adesanya against Stipe. But what's exciting to see out of all this, uh, Dominic Reyes definitely showed that John Jones is human for sure. If, if there's one thing that we can pull away, despite whatever you want to say about the judges, uh, that's one thing that we can pull away. Uh, 
Uh, rematch with Reyes, rematch for sure. I, I do have to agree with you guys. Um, I said Steve Abe because I want Jones at heavyweight, but 205, I want the rematch. That Unfortunately, I wanted to see Jones versus Stipe so bad that John Jones uh, against Dominic Reyes fight would have gone the way that I would have expected it to, and that was a dominant decision, victory for jo uh, John Jones. Or at least a not controversial decision, that is. Um, I would have loved to have seen him face off against Stipe. In fact, they were kind of John Jones was hinting at that for the longest time back in September. But that's put on hold for a while because Dominic Reyes, I do believe, will get a rematch in the near future, or at least next. I shouldn't say in the near future because I think both of them are going to be out for a significant amount of time. But I do think an immediate rematch is kind of warranted a little bit there. And these guys are pretty much on deck pretty much after that, depending on what happens, how long, just depending on how the cards play. I'm fortunate. Uh, do you think that the winner of this fight should be next in line for a title shot? But, man, that Dominic Reyes fight needs to happen again. And there's so many other things I want to see. Of course, I want to see Israel Adesanya jump over weight against John Jones, even though I think John Jones would absolutely smoke him at that weight. Um, but, man, I was really wanting to see Jones against Stipe. That was one fight I was like, best in the world against best in the world right there. Let's find out who's the baddest person on planet Earth, really. I wanted to see that so bad for many reasons. Uh, I do think that's kind of pushed aside for a while now, and I think y'all are starting to agree with me a little bit on that. As much as we do want to see it, I think that's going to be kind of put on the back burner for quite some time because this fight in particular is very exciting. I do think that Corey Anderson might pose some problems for John Jones, especially in the takedown department. Now, it seems like John Jones always has a takedown advantage going into his fights. Always. Always does. Even against Daniel Cormier, he took him down multiple times in that fight. Annals has a 95% takedown and they take down defense rate, the highest in UFC history. On top of that, or one of the highest in UFC history, Corey Anderson might be the guy to take down John Jones repeatedly and might cause some problems. I do think that Corey Anderson will win this fight and eventually will face John Jones in the future and actually might pose some problems for him, honestly. Uh, also, rewatch the fight. Jones was pushing the whole time, advancing towards Reyes, but Reyes was cray cray. I want Reyes to hold off for two fights. Joan needs to face Anderson. As much as I want to see the winner between Bohovic and Corey Anderson, I do think Reyes won that fight. And there's just sort of this, I don't mean to get into it too much because I actually do get fired up a little bit about it because so many people don't understand how the judging should work. People are like, oh, he won via Otzgan control. Well, yeah, he did that third round. And maybe even the second round. And what's so bizarre is, too, I did want to talk about that a little bit. I will dedicate some time to it on this. Uh, I don't want to take anything away from this fight card. That's that's not what I'm trying to do here. But 53 people watching, I was a little bit... I was not expecting that, I'll, by the way, guys. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, I don't want to take anything away from this card because there's so many fantastic fights. I don't want to shift the focus away. But I did want to talk about that a little bit. So many people... What, what's, what I find bizarre is I've seen so many people say, will the judges work this time? It's the big question, knock on wood. Uh, hopefully we won't see him that often. I do think that we will see him multiple times. We shall see. But what was I about to say? Yeah, what I was about to say was we all are in kind of unanimous consensus that the one judge that gave it 49-46 to Jones is re retarded lack of a better term, stupid, incompetent. That was not the right term, my bad on that one. But incompetent, not a good judge. He was messing up all night. 49-46 to Jones is stupid. However, we do score it on a 10-point must system, and I, do I disagree with that judge? Yes, 100%. I had a 3-2 to two to Reyes. But the real kind of argument and debate that we have, we know Dominic Reyes won the first round. We know John Jones won the last two. So many people are shifting their focus to rounds number two and three. I've seen so many people say, oh, John Jones won round two and lost the last three. But yet I had so many people say, no, Jones round three and won the and or John Jones round three, four and five. I had so many people say Jones two, four and five. But everybody's in unanimous consensus that it was not 49, 46 Jones. I always find that so strange. Why do so many people think round two to Jones, but yet so many people think round three to Jones, but nobody is saying four to one to Jones. Nobody is, nobody is saying, oh, rounds two and three went to Jones. 
I, I always find that bizarre, and that just shows how close of a fight that was. I didn't even think it was close when watching it, and even watching it again, maybe that third round. I, I didn't even think the round two was close. Um, I guess round two and three. Uh, don't be all PC, T-Bone. I, I'm trying to... Uh, the metrics in MMA really needs to be recalibrated. And, you know, octagon control is calibrated when significant strikes are too close. Exactly. It Literally what they say before every single main card is, we are under the 10-point must system. Round winner gets 10 points, opponent gets 9 or less. The the rounds are scored via based on, based on effective striking, grappling, followed by aggression, and octagon control in that order verbatim not quite for a debate i was a little bit off there i stumbled my words a little bit but pretty much it's based on aggression it's based on significant strikes takedowns or no i shouldn't say takedowns let me let me break that down from a fundamental standpoint anyway when it says the round is dominated by or when it says the round is scored by effective striking and grappling what that means is that the round is dominated by striking the more effective striker wins the round if the round is dominated by grappling, the more effective grappler wins the round. I've seen so many people say, oh, John Jones had two takedowns. Well, they were takedowns. And some people are saying, well, a takedown's a takedown. So it doesn't matter how long you had him down for. As long as you didn't advance position, even if you didn't advance position or land a single strike on the ground, there were zero significant strikes even thrown on the ground. Dominic Grace immediately popped back up. In my opinion, that's not a takedown. It's the equivalent to holding someone down and then having the referee stand you back up. Nothing happened there. Okay, so we got that out of the way. Who is the more, oh, and by the way, only when those are completely dead even, then you go into aggression, and aggression is such a broad term and it is listed out for so many different things, it strikes thrown, um, stuff like that. It's really bizarre how that works. And then, if that's exactly even, then you go to octagon control. Then, that's the very last thing, is octagon control. Obviously, that was dominated by John Jones, but there's so many people... Uh, maybe there's some sort of confirmation bias going into this one because people kind of pick and choose which stats that they want to throw out there. But I don't think that Oscar control is an effective argument for John Jones winning that fight. It's kind of like it's kind of like taking a fight to the ground. You, you're controlling your opponent, but then all of a sudden your opponent is like Tony Ferguson and he's dropping elbows on you, causing damage from the back. Who who wins that round? Now, there's a lot of controversy, and this stems all the way back. That kind of argument, I, it's, it's not quite the same thing, but I'm going to use it for argument's sake. Uh, this has always been a debate. Even back, Boss Rutten against Kevin Randleman is one of the most controversial decisions, especially early on in the UFC history. Kevin Randleman took down Boss Rutten and controlled the vast majority of the fight, but didn't really cause too much damage from the top. Boss Rutten was causing a lot of damage, throwing elbows, throwing palm strikes, you know, Boss Rutten. Um... And was causing a lot of damage from the bottom. And they ended up giving Boss Rudin the fight. Causing a lot of controversy. But when I was watching that fight, I'm like, yeah, Kevin Randleman took him down. But man, it was... Uh, he was taking damage from the person that was on the bottom. Boss Rudin was causing a lot of damage from the bottom. So it, it kind of is like that a little bit, just standing up. Even though you're taking the center of the Ozean, the fighter that's counter-striking, the fighter that's on the back foot, that's landing uppercuts. It's not like he was running away from Jones, uh, at least in the first three rounds. In fact, it was John Jones that was running away, uh, had more running away moments, I should say, than Corey Anderson, or not Corey Anderson, excuse me, did uh, Dominic Reyes. Um, so there's, there's kind of a fundament, fundamental flaw that a lot of fans just don't quite recognize. People love to pick and choose which stats they pull out. But at the end of the day, I do think that it was Dominic Reyes winning that fight. Um, especially if you look in terms of damage, which I think, uh, bottom line, only when damage is exactly even, then you go into those metrics. Okay, who had the most takedowns? Who controlled the fight? Who had out of control? Only when damage, and this is just how Tebow and MMA scores it, only when damage is exactly even, then, then you go on. And I think it was Dominic Reyes that landed more strike, that did more damage to John Jones in those first three rounds. That's just my opinion. Um, now there, there's a lot of people questioning the ten point must system. I don't think the ten point must system. And by the way, let, let's. I'm trying to make an argument for John Jones in this fight. So many people say, and this is the stupidest argument that I've heard so many times. I want to address this too. We all need to push for competent judges. I think at the end of the day, that's what it is. I don't think it's a problem. By the way, recipes Kevin Randleman too. I forgot about that. Um, 
I don't think it's a problem with the 10-point must system. I don't think there's too big... There are some fights where it doesn't work. There's a lot of fights on the last fight card. Unfortunately, that just it wouldn't have worked out too well. I don't think it's a problem with the 10-point must system. I think it's a problem with just incompetent judging, and there's not really a proper framework. And I don't think there can be. I think it's just such a subjective thing. Like, okay, this guy won this round. Why? Because he he's did better. But there's so many different stupid arguments out there. Uh, here's, here's one that I've heard multiple times. In order to beat a champion... You need to win rounds four and five. John Jones run round four and five, so he's champion. What 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 does that mean? That's one of the most confusing arguments in my head because you're acknowledging the fact that Dominic Reyes won three out of the five rounds, right? So I, I don't understand that argument. At the end of the day, it, there's five rounds, and if you won three to two, you won the fight. It doesn't matter. Who has more energy at the end of the round? And that's another argument that I heard before. Uh, if the fight had continued to a sixth round, John Jones would have maybe finished the fight or would have won that sixth round. I'm not disagreeing with you. I do think John Jones is the better fighter. I do think um, that if there was an indefinite period of time, if there were no rest breaks, and if they had fought until the death, I do think John Jones would have won. But in those allotted 25 minutes, under the rules of mixed martial arts, Dominic Reyes won that fight. Here's another stupid argument. In order to beat the champion, you have to beat the champion. You have to prove that you won the fight. I understand the principle of that. However, that argument could go the other direction just as much. If you want to stay the champion, you have to prove that you are better than the challenger. You have to prove that you are better than the challenger, so you have to finish the fight. That's one of the stupidest arguments that I hear multiple times. In order to beat the champion, you have to beat the champion. You have to finish him. You have to dominate the fight. That's... Stu so stupid for so many reasons like that argument can go on the flip side and you, you can't argue it back i could just as easily say in order to stay the champion you have to beat the challenger i mean that's that doesn't have anything to do with who won the fight at all again that's one person picking a side and that's another picking picking it you're picking information just to kind of sway it in your favor and that's the last argument that you can make when people say they pick john jones because in order to beat the champion you have to beat the champion there's a fundamental flaw in the way that you think and you are just overall wrong who won the 25 minutes that is what we're talking about here in those 25 minutes take everything out of the equation who won those 25 minutes dominic reyes did i mean i think that's a universal consensus that he won who inflicted the most damage and each of the rounds scored subjectively. Dominic Reyes did. Now, if you look at the fight in total, you can make an argument for John Jones because of the last onslaught that he had in the last two rounds. Those rounds were definitely well and true to him. It's weird. Let's be real. The UFC did not want to transfer the volume John Jones has to Reyes. And there's another one. Uh, a lot of people are saying, oh, the UFC wanted John Jones to win. The UFC picked John Jones to win. The UFC... Let's again. There's another fundamental flaw that people just don't understand. The UFC doesn't supply the judges. The UFC, there's a reason why the judges are completely independent from the promotion. Same thing in boxing. Because they have to eliminate that that interest. They have to eliminate that. It's it's a federal crime when that stuff when that stuff happens. Um, so people saying that the fight's fixed. It, it, that's another stupid argument as well because Daniel White has said it multiple times that's effing illegal. He went on a rant about fixing fights. Shout out to Elite XC way back in the day. However, was that Elite XC? Yeah, I think it was. That was that Kimbo, Kimbo Slice fight against uh, Scott Petrozelli. What happened, uh, let me paint the story about that one. It was Scott Petrozelli was paid to stand up against, or Seth, Seth. Petrozelli was the last name. I, I blanked on the first name for whatever reason. Anyway, was paid to stand up with Kimbo Slice, allegedly. Allegedly. They said, we will deduct pay from you if you take down Kimbo Slice. He's like, okay, I'll stand up with him. Sure enough, he knocks him out in just 14 seconds. There's a big federal investigation on the NXT. Still allegedly, because it was never quite pr uh, proven. But that was the last Elite XC that we had ever saw. The last Elite XC event that we would ever seen. So anyway, Dana White went on a huge rant when he found out about that. That's when he uttered the famous line that's effing illegal. It's the same thing to paying off a judge. It's the same thing to paying Donald Cerrone to take a dive. Again, there's you got to be careful. 
Uh, Timo, you can't argue with official rules and scoring. It's official. Yeah, the judges scored four rounds out of five, but even that, John won. Why are you arguing with the official scoring other than BS? I'm kind of confused about what you're saying exactly there. Honestly, I hate these arguments because I swear every time Jones gets battered and is always twisted one way or the way, other way to justify him winning. Exactly. There's no clear cut way. Somebody, there are so many different arguments for John Jones winning. Yet there's only one for Dominic Reyes. So that kind of shows to me that you can kind of prove that Dominic Reyes kind of won that fight just based on so many people are twisting information around. Like here's all the different arguments that I heard for John Jones winning the fight. It's either John Jones won round two, four, and five. It's either John Jones winning three, four, and five, and it's never both. It's never both. It's never both round two or th two or three. And then there's another argument out there that says, in order to beat the champion, you have to beat the champion. So John Jones will stay the champion. And then another argument I've heard is the fourth and fifth rounds. Because John Jones won the fourth and fifth rounds, he should win the fight. And another argument I heard for Jones is if you judge the fight and total, John Jones won the fight. John Jones wins. There's so many different arguments for John Jones, and you always have to pick and choose different bits of information just to sway it into your favor. You're exactly right, uh, Tyler Robbins. You're exactly right. John won, plain and simple. How How so? I mean, I, I'm honestly trying to figure out why. I, I can guarantee you one of those listed amounts of different arguments that I posed, I got it. I probably hit one of them. <laughs> uh, Rogan... Houston judges suck. Texas Athletic Commission, man. I even had a good buddy of mine that fought uh, in Texas, too, and he kind of got ripped off. And even one of he fought another Texan. I can't remember his name. But they go back and forth every year, like the anniversary of the fight. He goes, remember when I got my butt kicked? Like, this is the opponent he's talking about here. Do you remember when you got my – when you you kicked my butt and I still won the fight? Something like that. It was – it's a funny little story. Jones was outstruck one, two, and three. Reyes won. What's the first criteria in the system? You're exactly right. Race one, two, three. Jones won via decisions, but literally everyone else disagrees. Yeah, and it, it's unfortunate. Um, there's only one. No, none of our opinions really matter. And Dana White did was was kind of on the fence about it. Didn't really help us out a little bit in terms of the argument, but. Um, I, I should have made this a separate video, man. I should have went over this immediately after the fight. I don't know why I didn't when. Of course, I was a little bit fired up, not just because of the main event, but there were so many other fights. Let's put this into perspective. Jonathan Martinez against Andre Ewell, the first fight on that card. Again, I, I truly do not want to take any, I don't want to shift the focus away from this fight card because we had a fantastic fight card. I'll definitely talk about it uh, tomorrow night. Um, but man, I de it, it needs to be talked about. Um, Andre Ewell against Jonathan Martinez this is the last argument that I'm saying. Um, Andre Ewell in the last round controlled four minutes of the round had the opponent's back for four minutes that's Andre Ewell that is John Martinez had Andre Ewell's back and that last judge that same judge that gave it 49-46 to Jones gave Andre Ewell 30-27 he gave him the round where he was had his back controlled for four minutes there's already a fundamental flaw in the system, or, or at least what happened that night. Because they, that, I mean, that one judge was straight up wrong. And there's a computer crash in the fight. If you look at the actual scorecard, two of the rounds, uh, this is in the main event fight, Dominic Reyes against John Jones, two of the rounds were printed out. Like they're, they're like printed on paper. The rest of them, were written in by hand. What was going on? Who first off, who was judging a fight using a computer? That's never happened ever. 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 I don't know. John won plain and simple. Okay, I can't really argue with that one there. Get out John's nuts, Stanley. <laughs> Literally everyone agrees that Jones lost. I, I shouldn't say everybody. There are a lot of people. I think Brad Okimoto even said uh, John Jones. I think Luke Thomas said John Jones too. So there are a lot of people that are still picking John Jones, but I, I just don't see how. I, I just don't understand how people have thrown different arguments and I can always rebuttal it. I can always rebuttal it unless it was just a stupid argument. Um, I don't know. I should have made this a separate video. I'm disappointed in myself that I didn't because I love talking about it because we learned a lot talking about it too. It's not like 
we're arguing just picking a side. I definitely think that we can come to a conclusion saying there are a lot of improvements to be made so that this doesn't happen in the future. Really, I, I don't disagree with the 10-point must system. I, I, I don't disagree with it, I should say, because it's it was used to judge boxing early days, early days. And I still think it applies. I think it transitions over very well to mixed martial arts still. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just... And it, let, let's be fair here. It works out most of the time. It works out most of the time, too. They're really... Most judges' decisions work out well. There's not a whole lot that don't. Let's be fair here. But there's a fundamental flaw, and the flaw is that we don't have good judges. We just don't have good judges. And But yet, it's pretty cut and dry who wins a boxing match. Who landed the more effective striking? Pretty much. But how do you judge a big overhand right compared to a blast double leg? And how do you compare a double leg takedown where the fighter immediately stands back up to one where you control the fighter, land strikes, advance position, and eventually the fighter escapes and stands back up? How do you score that? It, it, it's such a subjective, and again, I'm a little bit biased towards the ground guy. It, it, it's just a fundamental flaw in how people think. I, I wish there was some sort of a point system like, you would, like there is in wrestling. I do think that's the next best option. However, I do think that will lead to people kind of outpointing it and turn it into some point karate type of fight. There's a possibility of that as well, where some guy, he's behind on points, needs to take down, needs to land four strikes or something like that. I don't know. There's a difference. Big John McCarthy is not the judge. He's a ref. He is not a judge. Big John McCarthy, the guy that wrote the rules, the official judging. Yes, he is a, a ref. You are right there. But he's wrote a lot of the fundamental, yes, he wrote a lot of the rules. In fact, he still holds seminars. In fact, I just saw an ad for it on my phone for judging. He's one of the most influential people in terms of the mixed martial arts rules and judging. However, the unfortunate thing is that there wasn't a whole lot of leeway for judging. A lot of it was just cut and paste, uh, copy and pasted from boxing. And there really wasn't a whole lot of discussion on that particular fact because we literally... The same judging that we have today is cut, copy and pasted from boxing because we just needed to get athletic commissions to sign off for it and not overcomplicate it. That's literally why. Um, we agree that Reyes won because we think Reyes won. I think John Jones won, but who won again? You you are right. He won. He won. He won. You're not wrong there, but um, I, I'm just confused as to why. As to why. Now, picking the winner of the rematch. I still think John Jones is the better fighter. I still think he wins a rematch, that being said. And if that fight was to the death, John Jones would have won. But in those a lot of 25 minutes, Reyes won, in my opinion. Um, Black Bush 2020. Um, but anyway, I'll wrap this up now. I didn't, I didn't mean to shift the focus. We've got a fantastic fight card ahead of us. I can't wait to see... Uh, Diego Sanchez get his first submission victory in UFC history. In his UFC career, that is. I can't wait to see it tomorrow. That's one of my boldest predictions. I want to see it so bad. Championship rounds is why John Joe... Oh, so you're one of those guys. I'm still confused as to how championship rounds... There's two of them, right? Two. There's three rounds before that. Three. Three to two. 3-2 to two Reyes. So you're agreeing with me, 3-2 to two Reyes. But at the same time, you're picking John Jones because these rounds mean more for some reason. I, I, I've never understood that argument. I've never understood it. Uh, I, I, still, I just don't. That's like saying in a three-round fight, the person that won the last round should win. I, I don't understand. But you're one of those guys. Okay. I, like I said, there's one of those categories there. It's either John Jones. I don't want to get into it. I'm, I'm dropping it. But you're one of those guys. I understand now. Um, championship rounds is why he won. No, no, it's still 3-2. to two. That's it. If there had been a sixth round, if there had been a tiebreaker round, the winner of this round wins the fight. Sixth round, John Jones would have won the fight. I still think John Jones is the greatest fighter of all time. But in those a lot of 25 minutes, Dominic Reyes, I thought, won. But I think we got it there. I love both of you guys, Al and Stanley. Y'all are great fans of mine, so I don't, I don't mean to have this tear each other apart because this isn't a personal argument against each other, by the way. We're all fight fans. We're all trying to pull for our own guys. We're all trying to improve the sport here. 
should championship rounds mean more? I don't think so. You might think so. That doesn't mean we're not fight fans. It doesn't mean one of us is better than the other. I, I want to get that clear. Uh, De La Rosa will not win, you chicken. That's an interesting fight. I'm happy you brought that up. You th you're picking uh, Barella on that one. And I, I do think it's a little bit bold to go with the submission. I mostly wanted to throw it up there because I didn't want to see so many decisions up there. That's really why. Um, I think I do think Barella will get the fight down on the ground. And I do think De La Rosa will get an armbar for back. We shall see. I like that one. Because in a fight, who's ever winning at the end win, right? Yeah, you're not wrong there. You're not wrong there. But 30, 20, or it's, it's still, I'm bad at math. It's still 3-2. to two. It's still 3-2. to two. That's not how fights are ever scored ever. I'm not disagreeing. I'm not disagreeing with you there. I'm not disagreeing with you there. That's still an invalid argument because you're acknowledging the fact that the round is three to two. You're acknowledging that it's three to two, but yet you're completely disregarding that and saying John Jones won the last two rounds. That somehow should mean more. Your predictions last night sucked. Yo, I know. No, it was four correct because John Jones won. Um, so it's technically four. It was four. Um, but I'm giving myself a pat on the back. I think that what makes up for that is because I picked Valentina Shevchenko via round three TKO from the crucifix position. I picked that exactly correct. I think that kind of makes it up a little bit. I think that kind of evens it out a little bit. Um, I get it, T-Bone. Yeah. I, I, should it? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question, though. Should the championship rounds mean more? Should a fighter... And again, if they if they do mean more, that kind of incentivizes fighters to take it easy the first three rounds. Let's let's take it easy. Let's save our energy for the championship rounds, and then let's win the last two rounds to end up winning the fight. That's not a valid argument in my head. I just don't understand. Enough to Jones and Reyes already. Yes, I'm sorry. We went. I, I already went over my predictions for this fight card. I already went over the, um, went over everything on this fight card that I can. So I haven't talked about that with a clear head. I still come to the same conclusion, but yes, I'll wrap this up here. Pretty, I'll wrap this up here now. So please tune in tomorrow. Uh, just curious if you think John John One is a better fighter, and he would win a rematch. Do you think Dominic Reyes deserved to take the belt that night? Yes, because he won the fight. It, it might sound weird. I still think Jones is a better fighter, and I still think Jones would win a sixth round, and I still think Jones would win a rematch. But there's a lot of 25 minutes. He was one. That's it. But anyway. We'll talk about this more tomorrow. We got a lot of great, fantastic fights ahead of you. By the way, I broke out the an oldie, an oldie shirt. I don't wear this one very often. Do you guys like it? Anyway, I'll catch you guys tomorrow. Anyway, this happened to you in MMA.